Welcome back to our channel, Warriors. We are still growing today. Another, another rare gem of an interview. A banger, man. Today, we have an individual that spent 33, 33 years in prison. California, no less, man. This man goes by the name of Rodney. Rodney, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. And yourself, Hector, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Just got done with the gym, you know. Yeah, I seen that last that last interview with the uh, former correctional officer who had retired due to uh, an injury with his legs, unable to uh, you know walk and run and, and whatnot. And uh, that was a very uh, uh, impactful, insightful interview uh, that really caught my attention. Okay, okay. So that what caught your attention when you saw that one? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's like it's rare that uh, uh, correctional officers uh, speak to the truth or what's. Uh, what occurs uh, behind the walls uh, from a in, from from their perspective uh, in, in alignment with uh, pre former prisoners or prisoners and just being able to uh, understand and be in solidarity uh, with the forward progress of being able to uh, to do well in life. I like it, man. I like it, man. We're straight shooters, man. Straight shooters come in all aspects of life, man. Um, so why don't you give us a a, a brief of where you grew up, man, and what that was like. Also, uh, so first I want to uh, salute you as a former veteran uh, in serving our country. Uh, uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, our citizens of America greatly appreciate that. So first and foremost, uh, we almost we always always acknowledge uh, uh, those soldiers uh, who defend our country and doing the right thing so that we can uh, have the lives that we have today. Uh, so with that said, uh, I, I grew up in San Francisco, California, in a neighborhood called the Western Edition. Uh, for many of us, we call it Fillmore. Uh, it was for, for many of us as, as residents and community members living there, a very violent, very uh, underprivileged kind of poor community. Uh, so uh, it was mostly made up of, of, of Black uh, uh, or African-American residents. It did have other cultures, uh, but primarily it was black at that time. You know, it was, it's a place where uh, you may, uh, O.J. Simpson, Danny Glover, uh, Miles Davis played at the Old Fillmore, and uh, things like that. It's a very historical and legendary uh, place of here in San Francisco. Uh, our current mayor grew up there. Uh, hey, left, 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 London, London. Uh, and so it, it has had its uh, fair share of success stories, uh, as well as uh, its, its share of, you know, not so successful stories, uh, mine being one. Uh, so uh, my mother, with Gloria Rice, was a, a educator and professor at the University of Berkeley, Cal Berkeley. And so, you know, my background in that sense was, you know, I, I, I kind of seen the truth early on. You know, I grew up in an era where, uh, the Black Panthers were uh, very uh, present uh, in the communities here in the local Bay Area, Oakland, San Francisco, Richmond, uh, and, and things like that, Vallejo. And so that that, that was kind of the, how I grew up. I didn't want to live really in the shadows of, of my mother. Not that she, you know, she didn't want to guide me in the right way, but just that I didn't want, <clears throat> I, was, I didn't have any kind of positive male role figures. And so uh, eventually, in not wanting to live in her in her premise or shadow, I, I turned to the streets. <clears throat> what year I was turned this? To the, so uh, this is the early 70s. Wow. We, let, uh, so I was born in 1966. I'm 57 years old. So by age 9, 10, I was already channeled, engulfed in that whole criminal lifestyle or uh, just trying to find my way, gain my reputation as a young kid, you know, who, you know, who wanted to be uh, accepted by this uh, group of people. And so from there, it, it, it kind of spun out of control. Uh, uh, you know, it's like you become addicted to the lifestyle from which you live, whether it's a good one, whether it's a bad one, you know, whether you like to shoot pool or play dominoes. Whatever the case may be, you know, you find something that you enjoy. Uh, my enjoyment was that I was, I first first and foremost, I had found a group of uh, individuals uh, who who accepted me for who I was uh, and, and, and not looking at me uh, for any other reason 
and holding me accountable on both sides with, you know, when I did something good, when I did something bad, you know, and of course they told me that, you know, you know what we're doing out here, you know, it's not always the best and right thing to do. These are, these are the consequences of, of your action. You know, you can be extremely successful, but at the end of the day, you can also get a hundred years in prison, and, you know? And, and so I was fortunate in the sense that I was given of what we would call a game in, in the street life, uh, I was given it. I was given it correctly. You know, I, I wasn't misled. I wasn't told uh, to do something that I didn't wasn't fully aware that I was doing. And so I knew that my, what 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 my actions uh, entailed. And so um, that that kind of like you know I I really kind of enjoyed that. You know, I, I I considered myself very articulate when it came to hustling and you know and being able to make me ends me. Uh, and I want to be clear so people, uh, your viewers understand that uh, in many cases, uh, but like mine, I didn't go into it like, I just want to wreak havoc against the residents in the community or, you know, I want to get rich because I, I want a fancy car and I, you know, I, I need a nice home and all that. I was, I was doing those things out of, uh, again, not wanting to, you know, be in my mother's shadow, but in, in a sense kind of doing that because I didn't like what I saw in my community. I didn't like what I saw uh, when it came uh, to be, being witness to uh, poor people and not having opportunities and looking in corporate America and not seeing people like myself, you know, and not really uh, those uh, black male role models who were, you know, giving those positive uh, affirmations and uh, turning it to, towards uh, doing what's right. I wanted to uplift my community and get them out of the circumstances uh, from which they were. And, and although and although I went about it wrong, and I can admit that today, you know, um, that was was that was primarily what was on my mind. I needed to make money so that my mother or your mother or my neighbor's son didn't have to live like that. And, and, and so, when I, I began to do a. a, a a gang of, you know, a lot of things that, 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 that allow me to, you know, be successful in that. Uh, I began that, you know, early on, you know, a group of me and my, uh, my friends, uh, two of them to whom are deceased now, uh, and many of my friends uh, growing up in this time of have either uh, died or, you know, found their way uh, behind prison gates. And so, uh, you know, we I began to commit some robberies and do some burglaries. You know, it's like you you start off early. You you're still a candy bar. Oh, I got away now. You know, let me steal too. You know, so yeah. and that's kind of that's kind of how it turned. And, and and so I I you know, and I began to progress and, and you know and, and find success in, in in drug operations and you know in in the weaponry and all, and all of these things. Uh, and so uh, eventually, uh. uh me and some of my friends, we we got caught on a a, a robbery where uh you know and again, uh, we were very young, you know, 12, 13 years old. Many people now, like in today's time, you know, they they they, they come into this criminal world and you know they're they're almost all already adults. Like you know, I, we, I was I came in early at an early age, and so uh, we got caught. You know, and the, um, the officer told us. Uh, uh, if you say you did it, then I'll let your friends go. You uh, know, all of us wanted to be loyal, you know, to feel more into ourselves and to, you know, into what we, we you know, we, we believe what, uh, was our gang. But it's we don't consider them gangs here in San Francisco. You know, we, they're turfs and hoods and neighborhoods and stuff like that. Uh, we all said we did it. <laughs> so we all said we did it. <laughs> and, you know, these are in private private rooms. So they, they were like, yeah, you you, you said you did it. I'll let, I'll let your friends go. And, and so we all said we did it. Ultimately, we went to court. And we all uh, were sentenced to the California uh, um, Youth Authority. So we went to the Youth Authority because uh, we had had these, you know, notorious, you know, names as young kids, you know, the younger group of kids who were just violent and, you know, didn't, couldn't listen or learn or, you know, care, didn't care about other people's feelings. Uh, they sent us to the older uh, youth youth centers. I, I never made it to like always close or, you know, I, I, I went straight to uh, D with Nelson. I was then immediately transferred after a riot uh, in the dormitory uh, to Preston. <clears throat> Preston School of Boys, 
uh, from there, you know, I was on Greenbrier and we, and you know, back then it was like, that, that was my first real introduction to uh, other lifestyles in the criminal world outside of my own city, you know, uh, or, or g- general location, the Bay Area. So, you know, now I'm seeing uh, Crips, I'm seeing Bloods, I'm seeing uh, Hispanics, and you're seeing all of these different groups of, you know, uh, Asians. And it, it, so it was just like, wow, this is like crazy. But, you know, uh, 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 you know, they, we're not alone when it comes to, comes to this type of behavior. Right. And, 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 and so I was just like, okay, well, you know, all feet in, let's, let's go. And, you know, and so I found myself uh, spending a great deal of time in Tamarack, uh, which is the whole of Preston. And um, so uh, that, that period went and I got out. <clears throat> Going back, before we move, be- excuse me, before we move past that, um, you said the, the OGs, the older gentlemen schooled you. Who were those guys? Like, what was their history? What was their background? Uh, so, so many, uh, so many of the people uh, that I learned under, uh, uh, one of them was uh, we. His name was uh, Old Man Larry, and Old Man Larry for me uh, was an older gentleman uh, who just kind of, you know, if I, if I found found out uh, like what it was to say that there was a positive black male role model in my life, it would be people like Old Man Larry, and although uh, he was living his life. Uh, he told me uh, the truth, you know, you know, oh, feel more slim, legendary uh, pimp, uh, you know, global who, you know, many people know of uh, would sit me down or take me on, you know, on, on his little excursions or uh, doing his thing that he was doing. And he would again, he would tell me the truth. Like some of this stuff you're doing, you know, Rodney, uh, you know, they called me Kango back in those days. Uh, and so he would he would say right in there, you know, no, Kango, that 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 don't make sense. Like, why are you gonna write uh, put twenty, you know, risk your life for twenty dollars worth of crack cocaine, you know, you know, or going to, to another neighborhood and shooting somebody uh, when you're never gonna go over there anyway? Like, why would you care what's going on in somebody else's neighborhood if you're never going there? And, and, you know, and he he basically would tell me, you know, uh, I can think of a chin or. Larry Door, who you know, who who gave me a lot of info, you know, a lot of uh, information uh, that was constructive. You know, I can think uh, one of my closest friends at the time, uh, who made rest in peace, was uh, Rick Curry. Uh, you know, these are people uh, who, uh, whether it was Chin or Sticks or Creature, all of these guys were t- giving me information, uh, uh, Mo Money, you know, uh, Chucky Barnes, all of these people you know, who told me, you know, what it is I was getting myself involved with, wow. you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, many times, and just being honest, many times they would say, nah, get away from here, man, you don't want to do all that, like, you know, like, don't, don't do that to yourself, you know, because, you know, with that lifestyle, you can, you know, comes a, an accountability of your actions, whether you, whether it's, you know, with the, the system or, or whether it's right here in the neighborhood, you know, and, and so, you know, and I think about that, and I think about oh, those people, and I, and, I, and, and again, uh, many of them have either you know, dis- found themselves deceased or incarcerated. Uh, but again, they they told me the truth, and that was, and that's the most, that's the thing that I want uh, to emphasize most when uh, we talk about young people, because many young people are not really given the truth, you know, a lot of older OGs, if that's what, what you choose to call them, is, you know, they, they do that with the intent to suppress or, you know, because they want to feel bigger or better or stronger or wiser. Uh, and, that, and that necessarily can come off wrong when uh, you simply, you know, I was, you know, it was a time where I was told like, hey, you know, you're going to shoot somebody, you know, don't go shoot them. Like, they would go go with me. Like, really technically like this is how you you know this is how you stab somebody or this is you know this is how you cook cocaine or this is how you you know commit a robbery or cut the screen and break into somebody's home like they were there with me so they you know so you know showing me the correct way from how how to do what it is and even again even though what we were doing was wrong you can't i cannot then fault them because they told it to me right and gave me the opportunity to make the decision 
whether I wanted to do that or not. And, and so, you know, I think I think about Aubrey and I think about uh, Fat Rat and I think about JT, the bigger figure. All of these people who have gone on, the Fat Rat built Black Wall Street. JT, the figure, bigger figure, was at Interscope and left him, you know, and built his own uh, independent record label with Messi Moore with San Quinn and Get Low Players and all of these things from my era of uh, rapping Forte, which was with somebody to whom I, I, I spent a lot of time with growing up. And, and so uh, these guys, you know, they were telling me, you know, uh, you know, I was an only child, and so you know, I didn't have no problem with playing by myself. You know, my toys, I was, I was cool. You know, I was just like, you know, and still to this day, I'm like that. Like, you know, you don't have to like me, you don't have to agree with me, you don't have to uh, want me around. Uh, I'm going to continue to press forward because, at the end of the day, my sole purpose and intent is to get us from the circumstances, the situations from which we live. Uh, and so that that's where that's where it was at, you know. And, and so when you ask like, who are these people? Like, you know, I for me, these people should be celebrated in the sense when I say not for their uh, un- unbecoming or, or or what we consider lawless behavior, but because uh, in life we have to celebrate growth. We have to celebrate. Uh, those historical people, just as we would say, you know, Cesar Chavez or Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, uh, these people, wow, they, the thing, information that they taught me led me down a path uh, that may, many would probably not choose. Like I tell young people today, you can say your heart as you want to say your heart. You can act right. as tough as you want. You can act as tough as you want to act all the way up until that judge says you're about to die in prison. All the way up until you're sitting in that gas chamber and they're about to hit you with that lethal injection. All the way up until, like me, you have to sit in Pelican Bay shoe for years upon years fighting for the mere right to just come back to the yard and operate and function uh, with, with people who, who are still, you know, acting, you know, acting on, you know, like they're not supposed to act. So, and I'm not saying that they're not willing to do that. Right, right, right. There's a difference between willing to do that and wanting to do that. Right. right. So, real quick, you mentioned um, that you knew you were poor or grew up poor. What were you seeing that that made you realize that? Like, were you seeing the other kids play with shit that you didn't have, or what? 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 What were you looking at at that time frame? So, uh, one of the things that happened is that you know, and I'm and I'm currently kind of writing a story on it now. Uh, because I'm a, I'm going to introduce uh, what I what I call the uh, the Chronicles of San Francisco, and it's just like my experiences of things that I, I've seen, particularly uh, in the area that I grew up grew, grew up in, which was Fillmore, um, but also you know events that have occurred in my life uh, throughout the whole entire city of San Francisco. Um, I think for me is what one day I was. Um, looking out the window and oh uh, and i tell this story i was looking out the window uh at the time I'm, my my mother lived on grove and steiner and uh, you know the neighborhood uh, projects the battle homes were just right down the street and so i was looking out my window and this uh teenager uh a little older than me you know they they call him today they call him creature man and you know they called him that back then but um and him and some other guy, they were walking down the street, and they, and they, and I didn't know them at the time. Keep in mind, I didn't know them at the time. Uh, but I looked out the window, and I, and you know, they had all these, this, these nice clothes. And you know, back then we were wear, wearing Fila tennis shoes, and you know, Elite sweatsuits, and you know, Adidas. And so for me, it was like, oh man, you know, these, those guys, who, who are those guys? Yeah. And, um, and, and so uh, that was like my first introduction where I was like seeing, I seen, even though they were living in the very neighborhood that I lived in, I was seeing that they, they you know, when I ain't, I ain't got no brand new feelers. I ain't got the, 
nice little gold donkey rope chain. Or, you know, I don't have, you know, I don't got the big old boom box. I got the little transistor, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these, these guys had brick folds and pagers, you know, back then, you know, that's what we were working with back then, just yeah. before, you know, technology really took off and you know, they had the, the iPhones and the Blackberries and all that stuff. You know, we had a little plug, you walk around with the brick phone, you had a big old battery attached to you or you plugged it in your car. And so these guys have, they, 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 they had stuff. I wanted to know what, who, who are this, what's, what's going on? And, you know, and so, uh, uh, what they would say, jumped off the porch and I went outside to investigate. I got to, you know, I got to be a part of this. Like, you know, I, that's like, I would see, you know, again, you have to take and keep an account. I live at the, in the upper part, middle part uh, of Grove, uh, in China, which is not a poor area, it's still in the field more, but it's not like great. Well, I'm down in the Batacones, or I'm, I'm down in front of Virgos, or I'm in the OC projects or Page Street projects. It it was it. You know, my mother was you know an educator, so you know there was a Catholic school across the street from my home, and you know big legendary park where you know they filled Full House and all of this stuff, you know, and so uh, I could tell the difference of what it looked like. Uh, to kind of feel, you know, my, you know, I would remember uh, my mother would be spend a lot of time away because of, you know, her pursuit in education. And so, you know, and there wasn't often food, you know, eventually after I, I you know, I, I told my mother I was going to run, run away one time. And she'd say, okay, well, have at it. You know what I'm saying? I ain't, I ain't got no issue with that. Like, you know, just when you leave, please, you know, leave, leave everything here, you know, because I pay for everything. So. You know, that includes your clothes, your, your shoes, you know, yeah. you know, all the way down to, you know, box of shorts you got on. You know what I'm saying? If you leave here, all this belongs to me. You know, I got the receipts on this. And so, you know, my mother was like, you know, she while she was stern, she was practical, practical uh, in her uh, analysis of reality. Like, don't be fooled by the fact that, you know, you're thinking you're entitled to this because you, you, you're you my son. Like, you know, you're going to have to get out and get your own. Like, you know what I'm saying? Before you start making, taking claim of it. Right? I respect so, that, dude. Uh, I respect that style, man. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so, and so I, I, you know, and of course, you know, like, summed up a little knucklehead little kid. I, you know, I did with it, you know, what it was. And I went out there and I investigated it. And, you know, I I searched to find what it was that I was looking for, uh, which was, was, again, was it acceptance, not wanting to see uh, people living in those types of situations, and, you know, and, and thus it began. I was, you know, you know, doing what I had to do in, in, in building uh, that credibility and name uh, that I wanted, that I wanted to represent uh, in that, in that uh, geographic location. And, and so that's how, that's how it was. You know, and you keep in mind, uh, this is before uh, the whole crack epidemic, you know, before before, before crack was like, okay. you know, back then we were now selling powder cocaine and, you know, and heroin. Uh, this was uh, the, the drugs of choice uh, in the community, uh, in, in, in urban marginalized black communities that we were we were feeding uh, our people. You know these types of drugs, and, and it was caught. You know, you know now, now you might go get an ounce of cocaine, it might cost you three hundred dollars. But back then, it was like twenty two, twenty three, twenty six hundred dollars for an ounce of cocaine that you would have to break in ten ways. You know what I'm saying to be able to get your money back. And, and so that's 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 and that's what we were doing. And, you Let's know, talk about that. I've never spoken to somebody uh, the before the crack um, epidemic. What what mm -hmm. was the difference, man? Like, um, I know I know the crack epidemic hit hit like crazy, man. Everybody was, you know, it was going nuts. What about before? Was it that turned up, or was it more controlled? So I I, I think what crack did uh, for the community uh, post pre crack era is uh, while people were on drugs and while people um were living that type of lifestyle that they were not uh more they weren't as out with it like you would see it like you you know but people were more functional you know like you didn't you didn't you know you know old school players you see like the you go down to the players ball and, you know you go over to sweet jimmy's in oakland and all of these old school players uh you know, they would be snorting cocaine. That was like hip. That was a thing to do. Like, you know, they were snorting cocaine and, 
you know, living, you know, these lifestyles, like, you know, you, you see in the movies and you'd be like, that stuff ain't real. But, you know, I'm 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 a, a witness to the realities that these things were real. Like, you know, they were driving fancy cars, and, you know, living like celebrities and, 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 and happy lifestyles that, you know, for a young kid would be like, oh, I want to be like that. Then um, crack came around, you know, and that was it, it again. So this was ap- after I got out of the youth authority. Uh, uh, some of some of my friends said, "Hey, they the, uh, they got this this new thing going on. This this is crack." So you know, now now we're talking the years, you know, early 1982, 1983. You know, we we. They got this 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 thing. I'm like, crack, what? Just just give me the cocaine, man. I'm a, I know what to do with it. You know, yeah. you know, I ain't I ain't got time to be talking about what you're talking about. And so uh uh my uh some of my friends they 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 showed me like what it was and I was like, what you know, they were putting it in, you know, mayonnaise jars and you know, and coffee pot bottles and we, you know, they were rocking it up and they were breaking it down and you know, and they were selling it to the public. And, and so then I I, I would go outside and, and I would see the difference between uh, the behavior of someone who used crack versus someone who snorted powder cocaine. You know, and while they probably got the same type of high, I've never, you know, been a uh, drug addicted like that. You know, I was a, a drug dealer. So uh, they, I, I would see the difference in behavior. Like they were almost willing to do whatever it was, you know, to, to right. get that substance, to get that drug. And, and back before crack, it would, they, you know, they probably would like that, but you wouldn't really see it. Like people weren't, you know, you, you tell some girl to ha- have sex with your pet bull. And you're like, okay, well, right, you, right. Can, I, can I get $20? Like, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. You know what that right? reminds me of? That reminds me of the difference between heroin and then when fentanyl came on scene. Right, right. Um, which, which, lead, which convinces me more that the government has probably created all of this and just fucking pushed it out to the neighborhoods, man. Especially when we're talking and we're seeing similarities, right? It's mm-hmm. how to keep the masses controlled is what I, my, my opinion. Right. And, 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 and I looked at it as a, a form of not control, but genocide. Wow. I looked at it in a, in a sense that this is a way when you talk about the idea of control, uh, when the when the population is overpopulated, or people become too successful in uh in trades in trades from which you yourselves have produced, uh, then you, you're gonna have to you know you're gonna have to shut this down, and you know you can you and, and this is a good you know it's like Jim Crow, so you're gonna have to be able to you know uh feed them the feed push into these communities this substance that's going to allow them to be impaired. Mm. So with imparity uh, becomes a lack of consciousness. And with the lack of consciousness, then we can then control the environment. So this is the origins of uh, community growth development, if you will. So now when we talk about being able to control, okay, some of these people, we just, you know, you go into some of these countries, you, get, you know, they say you can only have one child. You know, right, right, right. Uh, and so and so this is this is the, the combination uh, that formulates that one child theory. We're going to push these we're going to push these drugs into their communities. We're going to cause them to be impaired. Uh, these, these are strategies of war. So so now when you now we have to be able to come into these communities and, 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 and put this on them. And so they can't think. And if you can't think, you can't react or act in an appropriate conscious manner uh and and then again that's a way to, of control now we got we get them into the system uh we send we send them to jails and prisons we put we put these constraints on them to strip their identity and so now they can't uh you know vote you can't get the proper job that you need you can't survive eventually uh you'll fade away and die and so that's how you you know to uh, corrupt or destroy a community from which you uh, no longer want to exist. And, and so that's what happened. Crack was, you know, crack was, you know, real, real pivotal in uh, the scope and change of black and brown America um, because it was primarily done 
uh, in those areas. Now that's when um, before fentanyl, you uh, you had meth, meth, you know, uh, uh, and before you know crack, you had heroin and cocaine, but it really didn't do that. Like, like let's be clear, like, none of us got no boats, you know. We you know we ain't oh, running no big old military operations where we can push out tons of guns and drugs and money. Uh, you know, these are things that we've uh, purchased, uh, you know, from from those people who, who have those resources. And one of my things is that we can't continue to talk about a problem that exists when we are a part of the problem ourselves. Facts. Like, we, we, can, we can argue whether or not uh, Hispanics should be allowed to come across the border uh, and we should build walls and we should have gates and chains but we can't solve the simple problem of saying that we will not allow any form of narcotic to enter into America, right? And so we have the ability to stop it. If you could say, do you believe in democracy and we can blow up your whole country? You mean to tell me that we can't stop a single boat from you know, coming onto our shores and being able uh, to create uh, to create or push this narrative of impaired uh, ideology, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go for that. And, and so, uh, you know, and that's again not to say that uh, America is some evil force, uh, but we again we have to we have to talk about the origin of how things come to be. And, and so that that's what it that's what it was. And now we have this growing crisis of uh, of fentanyl. And see what fentanyl has done. It has created uh, this, at least here in San Francisco, um, this growing crisis of homelessness. Again, homelessness creates impaired decision making. Impaired decision making because you're desperate about whether or not you'll be able to survive or live on to the next day. You don't have something to eat. You don't. You know the the. The, the nonprofit that says that they're here to assist uh, closes its doors at five o'clock and there's no more bed space. And now you have all of these things going on and eventually you find yourself in prison. Wow, right? dude. I, I'm blown away with everything you just said, man. And I appreciate these conversations. I love these conversations, man, because they are they're they're real, dude. Do you see similarities between the fentanyl pandemic and the crisis and the crack pandemic? Or when you look at uh, human behavior, you get flashbacks or does that look similar to you? So um, I never try to look at them in, in a similarity. I, I try to uh, a, uh, acknowledge them for what they are. This is genocide against the people, right? Whether it looks alike is irrelevant. The action is the same. Wow. So we we have to say that does he drink 40 ounces or does he drink, you know, Hennessy? He's still an alcoholic. He still drinks. Wow. Right. And so we 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 have to look at it like, you know, whether it's crack, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's heroin, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, uh, stealing out of a store and taking candy bars, there's still things that suggest impaired behavior that will lead us to death or incarceration wow so we have to first acknowledge that and when we acknowledge that we have to acknowledge uh the origin of how it came to be and therefore sit at the table collectively uh and decide on how to uh eradicate it end it or call it into question if that's what it is uh, and so that's why when people say, is there a similarity, um, you know, for for uh, whether this happened or not? No, who, who cares? The, the guy's about to blow fentanyl smoke in your face and, you know, and, and send your children into, a, you know, into the hospital because he's he, he's using a drug uh, that none of us really know the chemical uh, right. that that produced it. Right, like, like we ain't no, you know, no scientists. Like we ain't no chemists, and so now we and we're encouraging it, and we're and we're saying that there's a problem. Well, if there's a problem, then let's get together and everybody stop saying my company is better than yours, my organization, you know, is better than yours. Okay, we you're fine. You want the credit, you can have the credit. How are we stopping it? Right? Like yeah. what are we doing? You know, so so like, like you know, you you want the money here, you can have the money. How are we stopping it? Right. Let's get to that part.
Right. right. And, it, and it, if you're going to say, oh, we're going to keep safe spaces and keep clean streets. OK, well, it's not stable if I clean the street and, you know, and you can walk up and down it and then I walk away and then they still get high. So that, that, that we, I haven't solved the problem. I made it look good. You know, it looks <laughs> nice. It's fancy. You know, that's because you drive a business on me. Mean that, that you're not a drug addict. So wow. We, man. <laughs> Wow. Right? We have to look. At, we have to look at these things, and we have to call them in question and hold each other accountable for it. Oh man, I gotta preserve this episode, man. This this episode is historic, man. I'm serious. You're dropping knowledge that the average individual can't see or can't get, man. Um, with that, moving forward. Earlier, you mentioned that hey, you may think you're tough until you're standing in front of the judge, right? And he hits that gavel or whatever. There you were, right there, man. You found yourself in front of the judge. What? How long of a sentence were they hitting you with as a result of so, everything? So, so my thing was uh, early on, it was the year of 1987. Uh, I was charged uh, for a string of burglaries uh, because I couldn't be caught. You know, this is uh, Diane Dian, Dian Feinstein era, you know, and so uh, uh, I couldn't be caught for the, the drug operations that they said that I was doing or the things that I was doing. Uh, when it came to weapons and stuff like this. And so uh, I got charged with some burglaries, you know, evading the police, you know, high speed chasing and stuff like that. You know, and so I was sentenced to 14 years and eight months. So I, I was sentenced to 14 years and eight, I was like, okay, whatever, let's, let's go rock it out. And, you know, we back on our lane, you know, we back on our route. Uh, uh, but well, wanting to, you know, again, you know, maintain my reputation and be the person uh, that that I was or felt that I wanted to be or who people thought that I was, uh, I turned that 14 years, eight months into a 40 to life prison sentence. While you were you incarcerated? Know? Yeah, while I was incarcerated and I tried to not like, I don't, I don't like to be, a, I don't be, I'm not the one who like wants to boast and say he did this and did that. That's what, a lot of people get caught up in like, they want to, they want their stories to be known. They want to, they want to, they want to, people to feel some type of way. I was sentenced to 14 years and eight months. I turned it in to 40 years and plus life. Do the math, figure it out. So did that, did that transpire in a county jail? No, no, no. Yeah. So the, no, after I went to prison, I was resentenced to 40 years plus life. Oh, so, after you went to prison. So while you were in right. prison. So while I was in oh, prison. I figured it out, I went, man. I did the yeah. math. I did the math. I, 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 I went and, and I turned, you know, I turned while it into in something. Prison. While I was in prison and I turned it into 40 to life. So, uh. Oh, my goodness. Uh, can can know, I ask you something? Yes, sir. How long into your stretch? And how long into your 14-year stretch did you upgrade it to a 40-year sentence to life? Um, six years. Six years in? Yeah, six years in. So it was like, uh, maybe seven. But, but, but the thing was, uh, so when I went to prison, uh, when we fast forward and I went to prison, uh, Vacaville, you know, they only had a couple of prisons when I went to prison. Like I, I, I listen to a lot of your shows. I see a lot of people on shows, you know, they're talking 2000s in. <laughs> You know, <laughs> late nineties. <laughs> you know, and, and then they're conf they're professing to be knowledgeable about prison. Right, right, right. They're professing about to be OGs in prison. Like, ah, school us, know. man, school us, OG. That's right, why you're like, out here, school us. Your 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 gang didn't even show up until 1995. <laughs> right? so, Hell yeah! Right? So you know, and, and you have to keep in mind that there were people before you. And, and there were people before us, like, you know, yeah. and, I, and I think about the Huey News and the George Jacksons and, you know, in the uh, Pilliards of the world who were here long before I came around, uh, you know, who made it possible for you to be able to have mail, to make it possible for you to have a television in your cell. Wow. You know, we're out on the weight pile, living 12 quarters, and you couldn't, you know, you could barely do five burpees, you know. So, you know, they, you know, they don't be caught up in that idea like you were the first one who ever did it, you know, because there were some people there who told you how to do it. Remember facts, that. Facts, right? facts. And, and, and so uh, uh, when I came around, you know, at the time, there was, I went to uh, uh, 
Vacaville. So Vacaville Medical Facility was the reception center for Northern California. Probably a lot of people, a lot of places, people went there. That's where you went. They had the green side, the blue side, and you know, and you were that was your initial introduction uh, to the California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. Uh, at that time, it was called the California Department of Corrections. What letter did your number start with? I have a D number. All right, OG. So, All right, so, right. If I call you OG, no disrespect, man. It's just, man, I just, that's, that's what no, I see. No, no, you know what I, mean? I, I, I get it. I understand. I do mean that with uh, respect. Yeah, but I, I, I have I have a D number, and, and and not only do I have a D number, it's a single digit number, so it ain't like no A B three number, you know what I'm saying? Where they got two letters on your number, I'm so tracking. you call yourself OG, you know, uh, you know, this, this ain't no E number there, you know, this you know, so this this is way back, way back, and you know, and that's when A numbers and B numbers it take a decade to go through those numbers. Now they just go through them, and, you know, you you have a number, and by the, in the next month they on to the next letter. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, it took a while for you to go from, you know, from a DA number to a D9 number. So, okay. you know, so uh, uh, I, I, I went to Vacaville, but again, I wanted to be, you know, big, bad. You know, a lot of my friends say, hey, man, you from Fillmore, so don't go up in there, you know, and, and be no chump. You know what I'm saying? And so I was like, okay, okay. Y'all say, don't act like that. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's going to. Can, you know, be a good follower, you be a good leader, and, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm going to do what I do. And so they sent me uh, to San Quentin. San Quentin at that time us was for the older, more experienced, more uh, hardened criminals at the time. You have, you know, San Quentin, he was going to San Quentin to Folsom. So, you know, all these other dude prisons, there's 33 of them now, but back then, like four or five, you know, three, three or four prisons. And so I went uh, to San Quentin. Uh, when I arrived at San Quentin, uh, I remember the first time they allowed me to go to the yard. You know, you go through your initial, you know, phase of uh, uh, in, uh, introduction. You know, your 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 little C status, if you will, where you would like have to, you know. Uh, Go go the classification, and they would classify you to say that you would go to where you were allowed to go or what you could and could not do. Uh, and so I was released. I went to the yard. You know, I went to the lower yard. You know, and uh, you know that up, upper and lower yard. The uh, upper yard is the smaller yard, and the, and the lower yard is the big yard. I went down to the big yard, and I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, you're here. What'd you see? What'd you see? What what stood out to you, man? Different groups. Uh, uh, it was kind of like my when I when I first went to the youth authority. It was like now I saw like the ugliest monsters of the monsters. Like you know, that's when I looked at it in my head. Like I looked at it like, okay, you're not the only one who 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 who, who claims to be who he is. Like he, all of these people legit, and what they say they are like, you know. Uh, we have to go back. You have to go back, like during this process, you know, you know, uh, and it's, you know, like I say, I, I try to not get caught up into those war stories and all that stuff, you know, because that's that's a setback for me, uh, you know. But at the time, you know, I had left the county when I had left the county jail. Uh, uh, Charles Richard Ramirez was my neighbor. So Richard Ramirez uh, was in a cell next to mine. And um, I, you know, I eventually when I went to prison, you know, you were here like dead man walking. And, you know, you look up like, oh man, I know this guy. Like, I, it is what it is. And uh, you know, and so uh, I, I looked out on the yard. I see the group of blacks. I see the Hispanics. I see the whites. You know, these is like back right then. It was like BGF. You know, uh, Aaron, Aaron Brotherhood. Uh, you know, this is long before Nazi low riders and all this old other stuff they got you know, messy for me, all these things, you know, I mean, all this stuff was going, I was like, whoa, whoa, like, but I said, I, I, this is the moment where it's either you're going to just be another guy in prison or you're going to be another guy in prison, right? I'm going to be the other guy in prison. And so I looked. And I seen around, I said, okay, well, you know, you got Crips over here, you got Bloods over there, you got the Bay Area over here. I had my weapon on me, you know. 
ran in the crowd, stabbed some people, did my thing. And um, so we got, you know, they laid, put the yard down and, you know, I went to the hole and, you know, but when I got to the hole, it didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out, right? Um, of course, everybody was like, whoa, who is this little young 19-year-old kid? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, but the dudes back in the hole, they say, hey, man, you know you messed up, right? I'm like, who the, who the hell? What you talking about? Like, man, I just put a demonstration, like, no demonstration. Man, you going to respect that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from Fillmore. You, I'm from Fillmore. You better understand that. Wow. And, and, and so the, uh, 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 the older guy said, listen, man, you're reckless. Wow. You're destructive. You're reactionary. They started using terms like, I was like, what the hell? What these dudes talking about? They were like, listen, man, that is a setback for the whole community. Not just blacks, because I was black, but for everybody in prison. Because when you do those things, other people have to react, mm. right? I got to go to the store today, man. Now you done did some foolish stuff like this. So we can't feed other homies who don't got nothing in their cells because we're going to be on lockdown for the next month with five soups. You know, you can't do stuff like that. You can't think simply about yourself. You have to think collectively, the whole. And if you go get in a fight and you win or lose it and somebody else gets in a fight, guess what happens? All of us got to get in fights. Guess what happens after that? I don't get to see my girlfriend. I don't get to see my mother. My wife just had a baby. I don't get to see my newborn child, you know? And so I started, I think that was like, when I would say that my, 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 my shift in thought was starting to change that, you know, I had, I, of course I wasn't acting on it, but I was thinking it in my head that, you know, that, but that again, they were telling me the truth. So I have to acknowledge and give respect and salute to those people who talk. Of course, they say, oh, yeah, we're going. We're going to go slaughter the whole prison system if we have to. Right. But but is that necessary? Right. Just because you want to be somebody. Right. Now you have to think that you got this amount of time to do. You're going to do this the whole time. Wow. Man, we, we ain't going we ain't going to never have nothing. Right. So and, and so. You know, and, and there was a, and so at that time, then in 89, December of 89, they opened, they, they had already had it in uh, construction, I guess, and they had opened up Pelican Bay. Oh, you're a candidate. Jump on the Great Goose bus, you know what I'm saying? They called it Great Goose back then. Yeah. You know, like, you know, we're going to put you on this bus, we're going to send you with the rest of these hard, you know, criminals who think that they the baddest of the baddest. Let's put you up again. We go back to that whole genocide thing. And we're going to put all of y'all up there and just let you kill each other. You know, so y'all want to be that way? You can't be managed and controlled. We're going to send you up there. Uh, so they put us on. I put me on a bus. I went to Pelican Bay at the time. It hadn't been completed. Uh, the shoe hadn't been yet uh, constructed. And so they sent us to AER, put us on Bedrock. Bedrock is one block. That's the only building on a facility that... Uh, has a, the concrete bed. All the other units had the, the metal uh, top and bottom bunks. That, that that unit didn't have them. And so they uh they sent us up there and you know and let us you know at that time it was just blacks you know uh, from the Bay Area. There were you know uh, a lot of Crips and Bloods from, from down south. Uh, and there was Southern Hispanics. They really they didn't. There, there was rare that you would see a Northern Hispanic there at that time. Uh, up until, you know, we just started wreaking havoc. We started wreaking havoc on the prison. You know, they had the big, you know, country fed, uh, white correctional officers, you know what I'm saying, who was like, this is Crescent City, you know what I'm saying? They coming in and out of Oregon, like, you know, you're know, you not coming up here and playing, you know what I'm saying? We're we going to demonstrate. You say you're putting in demonstrations, we're going to put in demonstrations. You're going to change that behavior one way or the other. And they, or you're not going to do it around us. You know, they, they shooting, the, you know, the mini 14s and block guns inside the child hall. And, you know, but just, you know they, were, they was not playing. You know, they, they was, you know, you, you got a beef with this other gang. Okay, well, pop the door. Let's see. I'm going to handle it. 
<laughs> you know, how your business, you know what I'm saying? Y'all say that's what y'all are. And, and so that's that that became life, right? And and, and so uh you know, as time went on, uh I I eventually uh the, the shoe got built, we ended up going there. I, uh we, I ended up, you know, at, at some point they they started transferring us out you know the people started fighting this whole thing about mass incarceration it's you know i it's solidarity uh, 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 uh be put uh, put in solitary confinement for long periods of time you know we would be in there for five years and they'd be like okay you you they, they let you out by the time you walk through the black gate you know oh we got confidential informant say you can't be on the yard and you back you know here you go with another five years so uh we ended up fighting that, doing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, hunger strikes, you know, doing a lot of, you know, uh, protests, you know, and many, many times, you know, I've been in situations where, uh, you know, cell uh, extraction, where we would say, right. you know, every, every, you know, everybody's got to get a cell. You know, cell extract one person, every, we all got to do it. You know, I was in the time, you know, uh, well, uh, Whitey was my neighbor, and, and you know Whitey was at the time head of the AB and all that stuff. And he was like, "Hey, listen, you can have whatever you want. We can be the best of friends. Need some cookies, want some potato chips, need a newspaper? I got you. Just know that when the door opens, I'm gonna kill you." Right. You know, and so people had that type of respect for each other, and and, and so uh, you know we knew the reality of it, what it was, you know, and so. Uh, I got eventually. I got transferred on uh, down to corporate. How long were you in the shoe for at the bay? Uh, so I went to uh, Pelican Bay in uh, 1989. I left Pelican Bay in uh, 1987. I spent uh, half, most of all of that time in the shoe. I went. I was on BR for some for a little while uh, uh, before they put all of those gates up. It was just you know, dirt, you know, and all, all eight buildings were, you know, have, have at it. So, uh, I spent most of that time there, uh, uh, in, in the shoe, uh, whether it was a D12, you know, the, or, you know, your first year, your first initial, you go to, you know, uh, uh, D4, which was the asset and stuff like that, you know, C1, I, you know, I did my time there, but I eventually ended up, uh, being sent to Corcoran. And so while it, uh, Corcoran, again, you know, we, you know, things, you know, things transpired. I ended up going to the shoe, which was, which, again, is what when I saw your show that that the other day, and I was like, hey, this, 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 uh, this officer is talking about the events that were taking place, you know, at Corcoran, and I'm like, whoa, like, you know, there's not few people around, you know, he, you know, he had spoke about, you know, the booty bandit or, you know. And uh, pressing tape, and I was like, "Whoa, man, this kind of sound like a time when I was, you know, when was I was that, right was there." That, like, was that that time? Yeah, so, so at that time, uh, yeah, that was at that time. Uh, you know, I was uh, one of the people uh, who who had uh, become and came known for uh, partic participating uh, in what they labeled the Gladiator Program. You know, and you know, and so officer officer would send you to the yard, you know, with someone of a different race and, you know, and that's what happened, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't deny that, you know, I right, went right. to the yard. And, you, you did, you got released to the yard and there was somebody there. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, race. you know, I'm, yeah, I went to the yard and, you know, and, you know, with different races and, and we fought or stabbed or did what they did was, you know, the officers would, you know, eventually, you know, let some period of time go by and, you know, you know, get it, shoot, you shoot the gun, you know, and, 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 and that's what happened. From my so, understanding, they, from my understanding, they were doing that to you guys every 10 days, every 10 days, you will get another go at the yard. Or yeah. So, well, he, he was correct in saying that, you know, I, I guess that that was their time. That was their way of trying uh, to create this reintegration program. I mean, this integrated program that they were trying to do. Uh, but again, uh, that's that's part of the story. Part of the story was, you know, you had, you know, you had at that time what they call like the Green Wall. Uh, and so the uh, Green Wall officers, you know, they they were like, you know, the OGs of you know, the prison system. So they didn't, they felt a certain type of way versus, you know, they really didn't have not, nothing to do with us. That's guard against guard. So they, you know, they made, some of them may felt that they were entitled to certain things and some of them felt that, 
you know, that this person might not have been, you know, because he talked about the favoritism like this. Why did this guy get it? Because he, he spoke so many different languages. And, you know, it could have just been that they had that type of, you know, camaraderie amongst each other as officers. And, and so uh, a lot of those things took place. Uh, I was there, you know, when, you know, he talked about how the FBI came. They, you know, they, they made the whole yard get down and, you know, came and they started arresting everybody. You know what I'm saying? They, they started did. indicting everybody. And so, you know, it was like they would, they did their own demonstration. They showed up, pulled up on the yard, opened the gate, all the officers get out. You're all under arrest, you know? So, you know, these things occurred and I was present when he was talking about those things. So that's what kind of drew me to the idea that I was saying. What was your mindset? When you were in the Corcoran gladiator fights, what was your mindset as opposed to you being on that St. Quentin yard as a, as a youngster and then Pelican Bay? What was your mindset at the time of Corcoran? You were more mature. You were more put away. Yeah, so, 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 by, so by the time I got to Corcoran uh, and was participating in, you know, uh, these racial fights, uh, which is what they were. They were, you know, racial battles, combat, you know what I'm saying, between racial ideology and, you know, the premise of, you know, me wanting to defend what it is, you know, I felt was right. But uh, I think the difference was my initial introduction to doing what the things that I do, did uh, were reactionary. And they were reactionary in the sense that I, I didn't think before I did it. I just, I just knew that, you know, I had to be somebody, be, and I, I didn't want to become a victim. So, I, and I wanted to represent Fillmore and I wanted to, you know, represent myself as an individual. And so I did it under those ideas. Uh, I think by the time I arrived and, and started getting involved with the, the whole fight in that Corcoran is that uh, I was conscious then. I knew, I knew what it is I was doing and I knew why I was doing it. And I knew that uh, it had to be done right and so uh when they say hey you're going to the yard it was like let's go like hey man can i can i go early like you know what i'm saying because was there any, was there any fear there i think uh what what many what many would respond in answering that they would all say no right they would all say no nah, there ain't no fear like this is what it is i'm gonna be honest and tell you lifestyle of a criminal, lifestyle of a prisoner, lifestyle of racial divide, community destructive theory is always based on fear. It's always lived through fear. If you didn't, you wouldn't survive. Facts. Right? A soldier doesn't go to war like I can kill everybody. Cause guess what? The other person's got a gun too. Yeah. It makes you free. I was just about to add that um in combat in the military, you have to channel your fear into rage. Uh you have to mm -hmm. as a survival mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's what it and that's what it is for the person in prison. And so and that or or growing up in the in the inner city. Like, you know, if you're not if you're not afraid, then you're not gonna turn your head when you need to turn your head. If you're not afraid, you're not gonna be able to duck when you're supposed to duck. <laughs> like and so, or you're not going to attack when you should attack, right? Or or you know vice versa. And so uh, and so, I say to people like, yeah, yeah, I was scared. Yeah, I was scared. In the gladiator because, fights, did you respect your enemy? Do you respect them? Did, did you respect your enemy in the gladiator fights? No, I, I always, I always respect my enemy. I respect my enemy because I know that my enemy has the same attributes and ability and strengths to be able to, to do what it is that I do. If, if, if that was not the case, then we wouldn't be enemies, right? If that was not the case, we wouldn't be enemies, you know? And so, uh, it's like competition. Like, you know, I respect the competition in the game. Like, I'm, me and my basketball squad is coming to your basketball, you know, and you're the other, you're, you're the opponent, then yes, you know. And at the end of the game, I'm going to say, hey, you know, you won, you lost, I lost, whatever the case might be. You know, that's the difference between what, what they would say, a hater and a non-hater. Like, you know, right. 
I'm gonna acknowledge that. Yeah, you you won. We get in a fight. I'm not gonna go over to my homeboys and be like, no, I, I, I beat him up. No, no, no. Man, he scraped me right there on that one. He got me. Yeah. He got a good punch in on it. Whatever, you know. And so. You know, that's the difference between being truthful and honest about the reality of what it is, because that's what allows you to grow, right? That, that's what allows you to learn. That's what allows you to cheat or become, you know, Muhammad Ali say, you know, I'm going I'm to go in there and fight. You know, he loses a fight. Guess what? I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to figure out how to fight better, right? Yeah. You know, I'm going to put it in practice. Kobe Bryant says, I'm going to show up at 2 in the morning. I'm going to shoot jump shots all night long. And so, you know, until I perfect this, this, this thing that I say that I enjoy. We, you know, and so that's for me. That's what it was. And I, um, I have to take advantage of this opportunity, man, because this is a good opportunity. What were you doing to train yourself physically, mentally, for that? For the fighting. For that, for that lifestyle, for the fight, well, for to well, go ahead, to go so, ahead, to survive. So it, 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 I wasn't training myself for the fighting per se. I was training okay. myself to to equip myself to not be the one, the fallen one to not be to to not be the one who didn't return from this combat from which we were about to engage whether it was you know physical whether it was mental psychological you know you have to be able to prepare yourself and be willing to accept that that might not be the outcome See, once you're willing to accept that uh, today could be the day, you you may not come back. Today may be the day you go out into the jungles of Iraq and find out that the line mine you just stepped on caused you to lose your life. Then you then become what you would say was the gladiator or the warrior or the soldier who should have been celebrated who should have been acknowledged, not because you won or lost, but because you fought. Because you embraced right? it. You embraced it. Because you, you knew that this was could be the outcome. And you, again, you and you embraced it. And so and so that's that was my mindset, and which took me back to why am I, why, why am I here right now? Like in this moment where I'm in prison, I'm faced with all of these, uh, you know, genocidal atrocities that are taking place uh, around me, whether it was with my race or any other race, right? Because again, that was an illusion of grandeur that I had to be better, stronger, or faster than the other race or or the other guard. Or the, I was in prison. We can't lose that fact. I was in prison. I was being placed in a situation where somebody else was trying to control and kill me off. Right now, is it justifiable? Who knows? But what I do know is that they had decided that you are going to spend the rest of your life in prison. What does that mean? Don't you know? We can go back to the seventies when they say, "Oh, seven life in prison was seven years okay but this ain't this ain't the 70s right right life mean life that means right. that you're gonna ride, you're gonna ride away on bologna sandwiches and you know and old cheese you know and you're gonna sit in that bunk and you're gonna you know and one day they're gonna call your parents and tell them you know what where, where you want us to send this body Fuck. that's that's and that's what it was and so you know i don't take no you know i don't take no pride in that. I don't take no joyous, you know, like I achieved something great. I don't think anybody who's willing to spend the rest of their life in prison is being smart right? or is being wise, is being conscious when the whole idea was to get, for me, at least for me, was to get my community out of the circumstances and situations that they were in. I can definitely not do that from a jail cell. Right. You know, I can definitely not do that by making my war with you when you are living in the same types of conditions that I'm living in. Right. Right. That that false indoctrination. Now I took it from the streets up in prison saying I don't like Hispanics. I don't like white people. You know, come on now. Right. You know what I'm saying? He poor just like you poor. You in jail right. just like you in jail. <laughs> right. You know, I, I tell a lot of stories where I tell people I don't even I never like to I never ever like Crips. 
And I tell this story for a purpose. I never, ever liked Crips. From the time I walked into the youth authority to the time I left prison, I ain't never liked Crips. I say that loudly because I can also say I never even knew why I didn't like them. Wow. I never even know. Like if somebody asked me, why you like, why? What's your beef with them? They live way in Southern California. You yeah. way down here in Northern California. What y'all got to what? And then it, it started dying on me like, this, this, this don't make no sense. Like, you, you're tripping to even to this day. Wow. One of my closest, probably my best friend, my brother, who, I, who if I was ever going to go back to prison, it'd probably be because I was willing to do something behind, you know, my love and respect for him. Guess what he is? He was a crip. Crip. You know, he eventually converted. Now he's Muslim, but he was a crip. And so I began to tell that. I began to tell people that story to say that listen, our indifferences are not so indifferent. Facts. Right. We we are we are the same, and no matter we don't we don't know. It's because we're not in their neighborhood. We don't know because I'm not over there in the blood neighborhood. I'm not over there in Oakland. I'm not over, I'm in San Francisco. I'm only concerned about issues in San Francisco, which takes me back to one of the things uh, that Fillmore Slim, legendary pimp, had told me. He said, man, all that stuff sound good, but don't nobody know you. You don't know, you nobody don't know you because you ain't never left San Francisco. See, they know me, Fillmore Slim, because I've been to Japan, I've been to Rome, I've been to Africa. That's why they know me as the legendary person that I am, right? And until you get out and begin to represent who you are outwardly, not just on your block, because the people on your block, of course, they're going to validate what you say or do or think. It's going to begin when people begin to see that you are carrying out that same attribute of behavior outside of where you are, your, your geographic. So and, and so that that's what I began to see that now 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 that I've stepped out outwardly, I see that the people or circumstances or conditions or neighborhoods or or or, or environments are not different than my own. And so they deserve the same respect, the same acknowledgement, the same idea in theory that we are all in one accord and need to move past these these circumstances that they have placed us in that they have put us that they have put us into warring with each other only to end up with the conscious understanding that we should have never done it to begin with facts where and, do you think that so, where do you think that stems from the biases the prejudices do you think it stems from genetics maybe I, I like to go back to the caveman days you know um fight or flight is it programmed pre-programmed in our mind or is it a like a like you said the government pushing you know pushing that agenda hey don't get along with this person this is why bam 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 and fueling that fire where do you think that stems from from your education and knowledge well i i think what we understand it today to be is that it's a taught it's a taught in human uh genetic from which we try to impose on other people for the simple purpose of control. Mm. Uh, but when I look at it, uh, I have to um, put it in its true content. And we have to trace the origin uh, back into tribal identity, right? And tribal identity, whether it was in Africa, whether it you know, was in Europe or, you know, whether it was in any of these other countries, we have to go back to the root cause and origin of why it is that we behave or think that the way we behave and uh, act. And so we use uh, we use saying that it's a forced teaching or false uh, indoctrination because that that's it sounds better and it, it and it fits our agenda at that time. Wow. Uh, but 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 uh, truthfully, we have to acknowledge that. You know, uh, as a people, uh, whatever uh, race uh, one comes from, is that uh, we have all been tribal people. We have all been uh, taught before we were even existed that you are to defend uh, that from which you uh, 
you come from, wow. uh, whether that's race, country, or otherwise. And so uh, as we move forward, when we acknowledge that and we acknowledge that they, you know, uh, come, we come from slavery or we come from oppression or we come from uh, ideologies and theories that suggest uh, indifference, you know, superiority, you know, then we have to look at uh, our lack of respect for humanity as a whole. Wow. The lack of understanding uh, that we are all equal uh, under the vision and idea that we didn't create ourselves. And if we didn't create ourselves, uh, and that we were all created the same. Now, we may all have different talents. We may all have uh, different skill sets. Uh, but ultimately, you know, uh, we all have a heart. Because we, we bleed, you know, we all have a brain with the ability uh, to nurture growth and thought and, and thinking uh, or the lack thereof due to, you know, uh, use of some type of substance or some type of uh, teaching that we ourselves as humans have have uh, put on each other. And so uh, I think that when we look at it like that, then we begin to understand. They say uh, that a conscious man cannot make unconscious actions. Right. And so once you know the truth, you can't then unknow it. You already know it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't up. be like, oh, I, did, I didn't know that. Like, That's come on now. You, you know, so you have to, you, and you have to be held accountable for that. You have to be held uh, uh, as one who's, who, who came to the people and, and, and put on them uh, the things uh, that you knew you shouldn't have put on them. And, and, and usually they take those types of people to the public square and they, you know, they massacre them. But, you know, and that's not physically. I'm just saying that, you know, there's, there's demonstrations that are made to let the people collectively know that this is not what you do. Right. Because this is not uh, productive to our humanity. Mm. And, 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 that's, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to get us back on is because, and, and how do you do that? First of all, I know is you have to unearth all of the planet seeds of corruption. You have to unearth that. You got to take the soil out. You got to, you know, plot new land. It's, you know, you got to put new dirt in there. You got to pluck out all the weeds. You, you know, you leave one weed, guess what happens to your garden? Facts. You know, so we got to pluck all the weeds out. We got to till it. We got to come up, water it. We got to nurture it until we produce that new way of thinking of conscious idea and that new way of behavior of wanting for your fellow human being what it is that you want for yourself, whatever that might be. You say you want a Benz, guess what? You should be having in your mind that everybody in the community got a Benz. Right. If you want a nice house, you should be wanting a nice house for everybody. If you just want the basic respect of another human being, you should want the basic respect for him as well, right? right? And, and so, and so that's where that's where I'm at with it because of the things that I've seen, because of the things that I know, because oh, I consider myself at that time when I was in prison, I would call myself like what you would call an in closet, you know functionable study attic. Like I was going to the yard and I was doing all the things that everybody else was on the yard doing, but I was going to my cell. I was putting a cardboard in my window so that when the CEO looked up in there, he couldn't see me, you know, or the whoever. And, and I was reading, you know, reading in, in thug life is, is a sin. Like, <laughs> don't be doing it. Yeah, who do you think you are? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so unless, yeah. you know, you're some Donald Goins, you're trying to read some other stories about, you know what I'm saying, other bad behavior. But I was reading and, and listening. And a lot of times people think that I'm not listening mm. because I may not be acting as if I'm not listening. But see, again, that's a strategy of war. That's a skill set. You know? Yeah, that is a strategy yeah. of war, man. So, so no, knowing, knowing that you believe that I'm not listening or paying attention gives me the advantage, right? Fact. And so uh, I, I, was, I was listening and learning and watching those people while you thought I was over there watching this guy. I was over here listening and watching that guy, Facts. you know, and I was listening to, you know, 
Barack Obama before his president saying that if you walk down a path and continue to walk, eventually you make progress. You just got to keep walking. I'm, I'm listening to Nelson Mandela who's saying, you can fault me for all the times that I got fell down. Of course, that's what you do. But try giving me credit for the one time I got up. You know, I, I, can, I can think about times where, you know, everybody said, oh, the system's all against us. Well, Gavin Newsom passed the law, second chance, right. allowed you to be on the streets right. to give to 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 produce that ideal of some, you know doing the right thing that you said you would do if they let you go. Right. You know, I think about prison when it was again CDC, California Department of Corrections, and Ruth Russian, who was a warden, fighting for prisoners to have rehabilitation which then became Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. This was not us who fought for this. This was a correctional warden who fought for this under the idea that if, if you're gonna send them to prison and they go back out, guess what's gonna happen if you don't teach them nothing? Right. They're gonna commit more crimes. They're gonna commit more crimes. They're gonna be back in the system. But if you educate them, if you send them to school, if you allow them to participate in programs that will improve and better them, we can then truly lower recidivism, change our urban, our urban marginalized communities and make them better places. So Ruth Resson gets that credit, right? She was a warden. I think about, you know, who I, I, I champion in a lot of stories that I tell, uh, is F.A. Rodriguez, who was a correctional guard who rose through the ranks, you know, ultimately became, you know, like a lieutenant, but was respected, not because he was a guard and we thought, you know, the guard, we were against the guard or the guard respected him because he was a guard. No, he was respected because he treated guards and prisoners equally like human beings. It's a guy who went on the 15 and San Quentin and got stabbed to death, got stabbed up, not to death, got stabbed up. Came back to work. Say, hey, man, you know, I'm a guard. What did that? Just because you stabbed me, that's not going to change it. Right. I'm still a guard. I'm still here and trusted. Back then, CDC was place of to house you after you committed a crime, not to correct you, to house you. And so, F. A. Rodriguez, he, did, you know, he did that. You know, if the guard didn't did something wrong, he admonished him. The, the inmate did something wrong, he admonished him. He did some good, he acknowledged it. This is the ideal of a conscious man, to acknowledge the rights and the wrongs of the human being, yep. right? And, and, and so these, this is our collective responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to those communities from which we say uh, that we want to do better. Facts, man. <clears throat> During that time, you said you were in Corcoran, you said uh, it wasn't, the 70s where you get uh, life and you're getting out in seven years. Life meant life all day. Did you have any hope or were you hopeless when you knew it was all day? No. So so when I re, uh, received my life sentence in prison, 40 to life, I want to be clear, 40 to life. So that yeah, meant that I had to do 40 years. Oh, wow. Then my life sentence began. Oh, wow. So... Uh, for me, once the judge had said that, I automatically, I automatically, it's almost instantly erased any idea that I was ever going back to society. I meant I didn't want to talk to my family. Don't write me no letters. Don't send me no packages. Don't, I didn't want anything to do with society. Not as people, not whatever was going on. I don't care, you know. I turn the TV off. That's how how disconnected I want to be. I don't want to watch no, listen to no radios, none of that. I'm about to go all in with this prison stuff. That's what you said. You said I'm got to die here. So guess what? I got to I got to make this my life. Wow. Right? I got to I got to you know I got to get actively involved in this. So there was when we say hope. I had to erase any idea that hope, the word hope even existed. Mm. And, and so, uh, and that's my, that was my reality. That's my truth. That's what I lived on. That's what I stood on. I could care less if you're talking about you going on a visit. What you doing? Going on a visit to see who? 
You going to the next building to talk to the homie? <laughs> if you, if you, <laughs> what you mean going on a visit? You know, you know. So you know, I didn't care about none of that stuff, and you know, I can be truthful about it. Right now, now uh, as time progressed, and getting back to me wanting to, you know, do better, be better, and uh, I felt that because I had lost, I had lost that hope for myself that I would begin to try to instill it into other younger, younger homies who were coming to jail, who were coming to prison, who were living in this community, that they didn't have to suffer that penalty and price that I had suffered and paid, that was, and was paying, right? Because, you know, again, I didn't want that for them from the beginning. So if I didn't want that from the beginning, then how do I get, how do I find my way back to that? And I think that's where, the change and transformation began to take form is that now I'm trying to, because I'm trying to figure out how to prevent it from for happening for, to them, it begins to make change in me. Okay. You know, it begins to give me hope. It begins to say that you have to live through lived experience and example. You have to be that from which you say you want for other people. Right. And so now, you start making excuses of why, you know, you're not going to the yard like you like you used to go to the yard. You're not a yard dog no more. You know, yeah. hey man, I got to go. And, and how and how did I get around that? Not because I stayed in my cell. No, I, you know, hey, I got to go to the law library. Hey, I got to. I got to take a group class. And I, you know, I'm, people know me. I was one of those ones. I I didn't really take all those groups. I, I'm not in it. I, but I, I was self-studying and self-educating it, you know, and listening to wise men who told old wise stories, right? And, and that once I investigated, had truth behind them. And so uh, that's that's how my own personal transformation uh, began. And then again, and then, you know, you know, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give credit to God, you know what I'm saying? Whether they believe in God or not, I, I know I do. And, and that, uh, uh, I, you know, if I didn't, I, I promise you I do now, right? Uh, 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 they showed up and they said, hey, man, today's the day. And I'm like, today's the day for what? <laughs> you, what, we going to the yard? They have a food sale or something? something you know, <laughs> you know, we're getting chicken? Like, what, what, you know, they got, you know, special meal? What's it? Yeah. They say, man, you know, 10 days, you're going home. I'm like, excuse me. I look back at my cell and I'm like, man. And when this dude crack, I'm gonna do something to this dude like he ain't never seen. Right, right. <laughs> Disrespect I'm me like that. Oh, I'm cracking. <laughs> Disrespect me like that, right? And they forced me down to the, you know, to the, to the, to the little office, the little counselor office. They made me read this stuff that Gavin Newsom had done when it came to Second Chance and. And I was like, whoa, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and eventually, you know, you know, the you know, the, the parole process, getting out of prison takes a little time. It's not something that happens overnight, but uh I ended back in the world. Did you real and quick, went, man, oh my goodness, did you qualify under that juvenile law? Or or what was that law? Though? No, so so I'm not under the juvenile law, although I was a ju you right. know, I want to say I was a juvenile, I was nineteen. Uh uh I fell under the uh, under the I did a second chance where okay. Gavin Newsom had said where Gavin Newsom had said a lot of people were sent had been sent to prison and that uh you you know just that may have not probably should have been there for that a lot amount of time. It's that kind of saying that they had overturned people who were getting life sentences who had, you know, had uh sold five bags of weed. You know, now, now you got a hundred years and you know, this guy killed somebody, you get it out tomorrow. And and so they were they were overturning a lot of that stuff and yeah. um uh, and so he, you know, and and so I ended up out, right? Now, now keep in mind, when I got out, see, you talk about fear, I guarantee you, I don't care what nobody say, I was scared to death. You would say, is a person happy? Oh, they're about to let him out of prison off a of life sentence. I was scared to death because I had made prison my life. Mm. So I never thought about if I was going to get out. Where was I gonna live? How was I gonna survive? What was I gonna do? I was probably gonna go right back to what I was doing before I went, 
right? And so, uh, 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 so I was in that sense. I was, I was frightened, right? And you know, but I knew I had that survival instinct. I knew, right. you know, again, I know how to hustle. I know how to, you know, you know, it don't always have to be criminal. Right. I just, I just know how to, you know, keep, keep myself afloat in some type of way. But you know, and I say that to people to to, to this day, man. I've been gone for thirty three years. How are you? How are you asking me for help and you've been out here for 33 years? You know, like, come on now. You know what I'm saying? Like, that don't make sense. Yet you call yourself a hustler. Yet you call yourself, you know, conscious. How is it possible that you need my assistance? If anything, I need your assistance because I ain't got no 670 credit score. I don't got no housing history. I don't got no employment, you know. You know why that is? that That is because the people out here have too many distractions and it builds entitlement. Meaning they can make excuses, they gotta play video games, you know what I mean? And it's when in prison, you're in there. You're in there. You you and that's what boss. I said. And that's what I said. I, and I used to tell people that when I was in prison, I say, listen, you always say that you always hear the stories. If they let me out of prison, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do that. I say, listen, you're saying that now. You know why you're saying that? Because you ain't got too many options. You could go to the yard, you could wear the gray sweatsuit today, or you could wear the, you know, the white sweatsuit with the shorts, and you know, shorts. you could, you, you know, you could eat bologna or you can eat turkey. Right. Like, you know, you ain't you ain't got no options, a whole bunch of them at least. Now, when you get out and the, you know, the girl gets the lap dancing on top of you and they get right. pushing the drugs in your face and, right. and you're getting all these different varieties of things, now your thinking is gonna change. Facts. Now it's gonna be like, you know, well, I could get away with this, I could do that, you know, and, and you know, and I'm one who admits, you know, I, I I thought all those things as well, right? But the difference between me and a, and, and I would say different other people is that when I in that fear, I was reminded, I was reminding myself that I didn't want to let those people down who I knew should be out who i knew deserved that second chance so i couldn't be the one who showed back up on the yard talking about i took their opportunity and squandered it right because i didn't deserve it so you know when they let me out i say i gotta first and foremost represent those people who never, who are never going to be given that opportunity? Or well, I don't, I don't want to say never. It's, right. it's at this point could have been told that they would not be given that opportunity, right? I don't want to let them down. My celly told me when I left. He said, "Never look back." He said, "Never look back." And I, and I was looking at him like, "I ain't gonna look back because I promise you, I ain't coming back." And, 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 but he was saying, well, he said, look, "I need you to understand when I say never look back." He said, that includes me. This, keep in mind, this is Sally. I had countless, countless, on top of countless of years, you know, who I knew would have gave his life for me. Right. Told me to my face, don't even write me. Don't even send me anything. This chapter in your life is over. You have to be able to move forward because it is when we look back, we become confused about where we're going. Right. And I really didn't understand what he, you know, because we always say you look back to be able to understand and acknowledge the mistakes that you make it so you can, you know, do better. But he was saying that that's, again, that's irrelevant to the fact of whether I drink Old English or drink Hennessy. I still drink. Wow. So we have to look at it in that, in that premise and idea. I'm not saying not acknowledge those things that happened right. before back in the past, I'm saying in order to move forward, I have to look forward. I have to move forward. Right. What's going on behind me is it's really not that important because you're either going to have to be on board with moving forward to keep up or you're going to stay back there in the back, right? And so I can't feel bad if that's the case because I'm trying to move a collective people. And when I say a collective people, I'm talking about all of us humanity's collective spirit Facts. to doing and being the people to whom we were intended to be loving caring compassionate and empathetic to all all of our existence 
right? And so that's where, and that's where I'm at. You know, I started getting in reading, you know, Elizabeth Hinton, who was, you know, and all of these people who were allowing me to open my eyes and see that no, I'm not going back. Although I put myself in positions what could have possibly sent me back, right? Due to, due to my own selfish, you know, feeling of, you know, not liking or disliking something. You know, that's the human error of mistake that from which we all have, you know, in, uh, 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 have imparted on us, on our lives as human beings, but not so much to the point where I cannot make that the option to go back, right? right? And sacrifice, because that's a sacrifice to all of humanity. That's the loss to all of humanity. When one of us goes back to prison, doesn't show compassion, empathy, respect, and kindness to the other human being, and that we are not moving in a conducive idea to create positive change for us here, at least not only as Americas, but global worldwide. Facts. And, and so that's what I do today, and that's and that's just where my, my mindset is, because again, conscious minds can make unconscious decisions and i could tell that's where your heart is too man you're passionate about this which reminds me you initially said you know when you were a youngster a child you wanted to do better for your community you wanted to help them and look you're doing it right now man you just took the long way you know yeah yeah and and, 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 and they say and they say you know it is it's not right world you take it's the end that you find right and so uh I took it took a while and lots of people don't know they be like oh he must have like this must have been a long process you say he took the long way i got out in 2020 i got out in 2020 i've written two very popular books overcoming gangs and poverty which traces the origin of understanding how gang poverty in in our social structure uh, is designed to understand why it is that we we pl- we've been placed in these types of situations, uh, and, and I begin that origin tracing right, like right here in San Francisco, but abroad. You know what I'm saying? So we understand that this is this not an American thing. This comes you know from different countries, and you know we take on uh, these these attributes. And so I and that was that first book, and then that second book, which is the Pathways to Renewal, a guide towards thriving after incarceration, is like. Like, I don't care what nobody say. It's like the blueprint to all end of incarceration. Like if you've been incarcerated and you've never been incarcerated and you use that book uh, and go through those steps in that book, you ain't going to jail. And you're going to understand how to keep people out of jail, which is going to re- lower recidivism and change the dynamics and the narrative of why we are in the situation where we are. And we're meeting growing crisis of homelessness, seeing fentanyl, seeing open air drug use, uh, seeing uh foster children being stripped of their identity and called foster children, they probably should have been called scholars. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, the system uh, continue to grow, but we wanted to decay. We wanted to eradicate its justice department because we don't want we, we don't. We would like it if we lived in a world with no prisons, right? But we have to get to a place where we can be able to do that. So that book does that. He then, you know, I then went on to- Where can, they, uh, where can the viewers find the, those books? So those books are on Amazon, on Amazon, okay. uh, and uh, I'm currently trying to coordinate uh, where they'll be simultaneously uh, introduced into more than 15 state correctional facilities, okay. uh, and all at one time. So that you know, but I'm I'm primarily working here in my state because uh, right. I, we just we just need to get this done, and and so uh, uh, those books can be found on Amazon, you know, or people can uh, tap into a. Uh, 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 created a successful online magazine, which is changing lives forever. Uh, Voices often ignored uh, on Substack, which uh, features those people uh, uh, who have been successful in their reentry, and you know has uh, you know other articles and stories that I've written or uh, that address these types of uh, issues. Uh, but again, it's that because. We highlight how many people go back to prison. We never keep the data or highlight how many people didn't. Right? That's true. We don't. True. We don't tell the stories of how many people who actually comes become successful because there are many people who are like myself 
who may not have did it quickly or in an extent that I've done it, but have, but, but, have, but nonetheless have done it, who have, you know, there are correctional officers who, 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 who no longer work for the Department of Corrections, but it's not that they, they got something bad or good to say, they're, they're living their lives, right? You know, you have correctional officers who were good, you know, who, who wanted to see you do better. Yes, you, you're the same as you have people who are doing bad, but we cannot continue to highlight all of the negatives. We have to be able to put a light on those things that have been good. And so we have to call into question politicians or, you know, or, community advocates, the residents who say that they, they, they stand for change, but don't want to be seen around nobody who changed, Fact. right? Or, 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 they, or they want to say that you, oh, we encourage what you're doing, and then they get behind closed doors, and then they try to shut you down, or they try to hate on you, or they try to do the stuff that they do because they still seek an acceptance from those people who tried to create genocide. That's big right there, man. That is big right there. I'm glad you pointed that out. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, and that's what I've done. And then now, uh, uh, my new venture is that you know I started. You know, my fiance Maria and I uh, created uh, what we call Change Lives Forever Limited Liability Company LLC. That where we are first responders to these actions. We are first responders to the needs of homelessness, you know, here in the city of San Francisco, where we provide emergency food, clothing, and the basic resources to those people keeping uh, safe spaces, safe passages uh, for pe- people exiting BART or people who are leaving uh, school or uh, individuals who are going, trying to go to the uh, workplace who just want to simply live their lives, you know, the, the, we can no longer allow the terrorism. I'm going to call it terrorism. We can no longer allow the terrorism of drug use. Facts. Right. We can no longer allow open air drug use to 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 control uh, our way of movement. My daughter or granddaughter or child or your granddaughter or child should be allowed to walk down the street without having to have an impaired substance blown into their face. Right, or having to witness uh, countless uh, homeless people when they're standing or sleeping in front of a vacant building, right? And the owner saying, "Why are these people in front of my building?" Right, because you you've risen the cost of living and said that it costs thirty five dollars an hour to live in the city of San Francisco, but I'm only gonna give you twelve. <laughs> right, <laughs> so you know you're gonna have to figure out how to get the other half. Right. <laughs> So we, we, we have to address these issues and because, you know, and with this company changing lives forever, now it's, it's clear, everybody knows. I got the formula solution. I don't care what state, state or county they put us in. It, it, it's going to make you change. It's going to change the lives and dynamics and narrative of what's going on. And so, you know, now he's going into the juveniles. He's mentoring children. Uh, I'll soon be returning back to the uh, Department of Correction, right. you know, and speaking, and speaking on this. And it's just that, again, at the end of the day, you know, we have to be and live in the idea of what we would say, a, a vision. I have a vision that this life will be this. No, you gotta live that life. You gotta Max. you gotta live that you gotta live that vision. Right. You gotta you gotta be the hector of the world and say, you know, I I no longer work to the Department of Corrections, I'm gonna start this podcast. Right. We're gonna become warriors and speak to the realities and truth of what it is and you know, however that might come out. Facts. Right. It, it, you could either like it or you don't, but guess what? You ain't gonna stop it. You know, you ain't gonna, <laughs> yep. tell, you ain't gonna tell Hector he can't have his podcast. True. You know, you ain't gonna tell Rodney he can't, you know, go out here and try to change the world. True. You know, because guess what? You're gonna wake up in the morning and, and it's gonna be another episode. We're gonna do it all over <laughs> again, man. We're gonna do it all over We're again. All over again. So, so I'm gonna put all the links to everything that you know that you just said right now so people can tap in, right? You mentioned you're, it's only California. I'm in California. You're in California. And we've almost found, figured out the blueprint, right? We're just fine-tuning it. We're, we're hitting it at different angles to fix an issue, a drastic issue. But there's no reason why we can't repeat this process in the other states. Man, we, right. we, we become the, the model. model. Correct. We become the social model of what we want, which is change in, 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 in the human spirit of humanity. And so uh, when, when you are doing the right thing, they say the right thing don't 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 require no explanation. It don't need to be defined. It is the right thing, right? Max. It's only when we're doing the wrong thing that we try to put definition on it. 
<laughs> yeah. so, 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 so that you know, we try to explain it, you know. So, so that's what we're doing, and and, and I'm not saying it's. I'm not just in California, like like I said, right. I'm dealing with multiple states, mo- in multiple ways to to bring about this change. Nice. Uh, uh, but we have, you know, I say here in California because I'm here in California. You know, if they say, hey, Rodney, you know, we need you to fly out to New York, Atlanta. I'll be on the next thing smoking, yeah. you know, because with the, this is this is serious. I'm in the business of serious change. I'm not in the business of perception. I'm in the business of reality. You know, I'm not in the business of wanting to be accepted. You don't got to like it or not. Guess what? We're going to change this and you ain't going to be able to stop it. Fact. Changing lives forever is going to change this and you ain't going to be able to stop it. You ain't gonna be able to say he doing too much hollering. He getting too comfortable. You ain't gonna be, all them doors gonna be, you know, they gonna be shut down and closed. And you are gonna be exposed for being the person to who you are, saying that you wanted to encourage me, but you really didn't. So, you know, uh, I just continue to encourage people to do the right thing, man. To to know that you know there will be people who follow us. We may say that we are OGs. And if you original, that means you started it. But guess what? We ain't OGs. Facts. We didn't start it. But guess what? We going to finish it. And when we finish our part and our collective responsibility in it, then it's going to be those people who follow us to do the same. Now, when it comes to that, if we leave them false information, mm. untrue, and untransparent idea, then guess what they will produce? False, incorrect, untransparent idea. If we tell them the truth, as those people told me the truth when I was growing up, hey, you could make a lot of money selling drugs, but you could also do 100 years. Choice is yours. We have to be able to give them the options and opportunities to be able to make informative, correct, conscious, positive decisions. Oh my goodness, man. We're definitely built for this. I'll tell you that I'll tell you that much, man. We're built for this, you know, the mission. You mentioned God earlier, and I'm a firm believer in God as well, man. He didn't pick us for no reason. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Absolutely. My <laughs> but, fiance Maria say it all the time. She said, you know, and when I get discouraged, she say, Listen, God put you in position. Right. My grandmother told me before she died, don't be trying to make no plans and make you know, thinking you you you're a better planter than him. You know what I'm right. saying? When you could create a human life. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and put all the components in it, then we just have a conversation. But until then, we're going to put that in God's hands and let him make those decisions. You continue to do what he, he has instructed you to do because God say, shall it be will, then it is done. And, and so uh, that's how I'm going to leave it. That's where I'm at with it. Uh, and God has said that, you know, change is coming and change will arrive. Man, I'm right there with you, man. I appreciate you for coming on the show and giving, oh my God, an hour and 42 minutes of pure gold, man. That is, that is going to change the world. I can guarantee you. I, man, with that, I'm going to close out, but don't get off the line yet, man. And then I'm going to holler at you after. Hold on. Hey, there yeah, you dude. guys have it. I, I, whew, he reached out to me in an email. I'm like, oh, I got to jump on this, man. And um, wow, I, I, said, I even told him, I don't even want to talk to you on the phone. I want to hear it all in, on the, in person. And yeah, there it is there. You guys, listen to the man's message. With that, thank you guys. Keep pushing forward.